Thank you. So in 2010, I found myself 90 miles south of Las Vegas in a poor man's version of Reno called Laughlin. Uh, it's just at the border of Arizona. And that uh, river you see is what divides Laughlin and Arizona. And it's just between time zones too. So uh, when I was at a conference and the time kept switching on my phone, it was, it was very confusing. Um, I was there to hang out with people who felt like they had been abducted by aliens. These are people who believed they had been abducted and taken away by extraterrestrials and that they'd had some kind of contact with them. Um, I learned that not everybody considers themselves having been abducted. Some of them had very positive experiences. And in fact, uh, the whole scene isn't as unified as you would think. Um, I went in there thinking that aliens were known to look like this, big heads, black eyes, uh, gray, and, uh, and, and prone to doing bizarre sexual experiments on humans, anal probes, and, and making hybrids between uh, aliens and people. But that's kind of old school at this point. It had fallen well out of fashion, and people seemed to be competing with one another to tell more and more bizarre stories about uh, more and more different types of, of alien life forms. Uh, but um, despite the, the disunity and disagreement, there was an agreement within the experiencer group that nobody would question anybody else's reality. And it's, it's very difficult to maintain your cognitive dissonance sometimes with some very bizarre, deeply held beliefs, but, but this was very helpful to them. And, and they felt that um, it was very nice to be in an environment where you could just be validated and you could, uh, and you could go and, and, and simply be believed, even though I got the impression that most people were listening to each other without really believing the credibility in anybody else, but really looking forward to telling their own story for whatever reason. But there was a prohibition against inquiry, and there was definitely a prohibition against questioning anybody else's, uh, anybody else's belief in, in, in their alien abduction experience. And in one bizarre moment, there was a woman who showed us an illustration, crude illustrations, many of them, and they all resembled uh, very well-known cinematic aliens. Uh, there was a crude rendering of E.T., and it was labeled E.T., and she told us, I call this one E.T. And I thought that that sounded very natural, of course. And there was a, even one of Yoda, who she referred to as Yoda. And for a moment, I thought, she must be fucking with us. That she, that she too, was an interloper. And that she was probably talking to a hidden camera. And that she was making a big joke of, uh, of the abductees. But the more she spoke, the more I became convinced that that wasn't the case. Um, she did address the fact that these crude renderings by the names of their cinematic counterparts were recognizable as being film aliens. And she explained that as a, uh, and this is a prevalent notion. There was a lot of conspiracy theories at this, at this conference in general. Um, people don't generally just have one weird belief, but, um, uh, her feeling was that Hollywood knew. Ho Hollywood knew about these aliens, and this, was, this has been a, a, a long, decades-long program to warm us up to the idea. Uh, they have their kind of own uh, revelations idea where the day will come, and all will be revealed, and the truth will come out, and Hollywood, the rest of the media, is all working towards that goal at some point. People are trying to slip it out there. Um, now, these people in this insular environment, it's easy for them to kind of hold to these deeply held beliefs. And none of them really were entirely lying. Some people would lie, I think, to make up evidence. But um, part of the reason people had these deeply held beliefs was they had been going to regressive, they'd been going through hypnotic regression and other memory recovery techniques to learn what had been concealed from their consciousness and oftentimes those, those uh, narratives involved being abduct, abducted by aliens. But they only seem to, to involve that when the hypnotherapist believes that people are being abducted by aliens and this is, that this is a prevalent problem. So obviously there's an interplay between the therapist and, and the people going through the therapy. And within the hypnoregression therapeutic scene, obviously, 
there isn't agreement as to how this is properly done or what's the, the proper narrative because some of these narratives are mutually exclusive. And we uh, spoke to some of the hypnotherapists and, and you can see this kind of juxtaposition in their opinions on this clip. There are a lot of people who think that this is benevolent and that these beings are kind, wonderful, and loving. They have two things in common. <clears throat> They've gone to a person for hypnosis who has that agenda and bestows that agenda upon their memories, or they've had no hypnosis whatsoever. And they're mistaking certain procedures for love and affection, which they don't understand. <clears throat> which they don't understand. So these are evil aliens? I'm not going to say they're malevolent or benevolent. I'm saying that they're working for their own agenda that, that, include, that doesn't include us, let's put it that way, or might include us in a peripheral way, but they're doing this. This is a program we're looking at that is, <clears throat> we used to think that this was a study, that this was a, uh, that they were learning about us, that, you know, that they were grabbing people like Barney and Betty Hill and, 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 and seeing what makes them tick. The evidence, after years of laboring under this evidence, it didn't hold. We couldn't, it, we, the evidence just wasn't there. So what are they doing with this? This is a program, and the program, as a program, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's goal-directed. What's the goal? In other words, they're doing this for a reason. I'll ask the questions around here. <laughs> and uh, they're doing this for a reason. And so what is the reason? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who have posited they have a dying planet, they have, they're looking for resources, they're blah, 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 blah. Uh, but um, the reasons for the ultimate reason, and I'm skipping things, the ultimate reason, we don't really know. We don't really know the ultimate reason. My personal opinion is that it's an integration program into the society by hybrids. That could be wrong, uh, um, but uh, we don't know why. We don't know why. Well, a lot of people think something terrible has happened to them when they've had a UFO experience. They think they've been traumatized. They think they've been hurt in some way. Well, when I found out, that's not what happened at all. It can be a very gentle experience, but their conscious mind has made it into something that's fearful. That's the difference. And it's not really what happened at all. I just want to interrupt for one question. Can you tell me about an example with a gentle experience? And uh, just look at him. Hmm. There's so many of them. I'm just trying to think of. Uh, well, there was one. I have to go back and figure how it was. I was I preface it. But one lady, um, she kept saying she'd had experiences with the, the, the ETs and that they'd taken her on board a craft and they said they did all these terrible things to her. And one of the things they said was that they cut her breast. And I said, no, 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 that does not happen. And all kinds of traumatic things that she remembered that they had done to her physically. But when I had the session, we found out that wasn't true at all. And they explained it. We know women are sensitive about their breasts. And they said during their examination they had to do, we accidentally brushed against her. And that was all that happened. But she interpreted that when she woke up as being hurt. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, clearly they're forming the narrative under their, their hypnotic regression. And if you would speak to David Jacobs and Dolores Cannon like I have, they're very adamant that there's no leading at all in, in any of this. But of course, this, this is very much in, in the field of what people consider insane and, and very much uh, uh, not taken seriously, the, the, the narrative of... Uh, of, of alien abduction, but it's uh, but what's scary about it is um, these people who undergo this uh, this regressive therapy inform these false memories of abusive uh, contact. Um, th th these memories uh, react in, in a in a very in a very real traumatic way. There was a study done at Harvard uh, led by Richard McNally, who's a professor over there, which tested psychophysiological responding. Uh, related to script-driven imagery, um, related to alien contact with people who felt that they were abusively abducted by aliens. 
in what was found is that they, they, they had very traumatic responses. They, they, they believe this, these were, these were embedded memories and these were, these were traumatic memories for them, even though they weren't true. And uh, a grad student of Richard McNally's went, went on later to write a book about the alien abduction scene. Oops, sorry, wrong button. And she, she traced the, the origins of the belief and, the, and how, the, uh, how the false memories evolve in a culture where people have this kind of unified belief of alien abduction, which, which I said isn't really unified after all. And um, what was interesting about that is, is Susan Clancy was, was pilloried as somebody who, because she was doing this research, was protecting pedophilia. And you, you might wonder how you would get from from their, from alien abduction to being accused of protecting pedophilia. But if you uh, understand where these notions of traumatic repression come from and these techniques of drawing forth the memories, uh, you realize that there's nothing different in the psychotherapeutic community when they do this to try to uh, bring forward supposedly repressed memories of incest or whatever else. So if you call bullshit on this, it calls into question the entire industry and then people claim that Susan Clancy is, is protecting pedophilia. I went uh, about a year before that conference to a conference of people who felt that they had been ritually abused or subjects of government mind control, and they also had hidden memories of this. And I noted in the report I had written about the conference that one of the first things I noticed was that at, the, uh, at one of the vending booths, they were selling a more advanced species of tinfoil hat, as I, <laughs> as I characterized it, but that, that's from the catalog of the vendor that was selling it, a classic baseball cap lined with a fabric that uses silver and copper threads uh, to create an, an electromagnetic frequency shield. And there was also socks you could get with this and, and other, and other uh, convenient outerwear and those types of things. And there was a, there was a woman there, who she was all of, 40 years old, went by the name of Royal, and she was claiming that she personally was a mind-controlled uh, mind slave of uh, Nazi Dr. Joseph Mengele. And um, she was relating abortions to Satanism, and she said, uh, my experience with Mengele involved much of the trauma-based mind control involving core programming, such as end-time programming, that is connected to the global takeover. He used the psychic spiritual dimensions using what I have come to call demonic harmonics, which involve using musical tones and quantum physics to open up portals into the spiritual realms. I also have core programs set up that were created using abortions as a means to develop them and more. Um, what was really scary about this was there were licensed medical mental health professionals there getting continuing education units for seeing this kind of bullshit. And this was considered a, a professional conference in that regard. Um, and there was also a prohibition within this support group against critical inquiry of any kind. There was uh, this idea that uh, confronting anybody's narrative, no matter how implausible it, it could be, is triggering. Um, and, and this was my first introduction to the concept of safe spaces. So this is kind of a kind of gives you an idea why I have reservations about that now. And people can say, well, satanic ritual abuse and alien abduction, those are uh, entirely different premises. And if you start out with a, with a different premise and, and have a safe space environment where you have this insular positive feedback loop, it's something different. But really, the alien abduction people and the, uh, well, especially the satanic ritual abuse people, will tell you that they're only coming from a premise that Certain tra traumas are, are so, uh, so oppressive that the mind represses them, and at the core of it, they just believe that child sexual abuse is wrong. And if you question that, if you, if you question any element of what they're saying, you're questioning that. So you can start somewhere with the best intentions, but if you shut off all critical inquiry or, or free speech in any type of way, um, I think this, this kind of product is not an outlier. This is a natural byproduct of shutting yourself off from, from critical inquiry and debate. Now this woman, Gigi Jordan, in uh, 2010, murdered her eight-year-old autistic child, and she did so 
because she thought he wasn't actually autistic at all. She thought that he was being tormented by some unseen satanic conspiracy and that the only way to preserve him from further sufferings was to uh, apparently hold him down, sit on his chest until he was uh, quite bruised, according to the prosecution, and force feed him an overdose of uh, Xanax and Ambien with vodka. Um, what was really disturbing about this case to me, besides obviously she killed the kid, was that there, was, uh, there were many opportunities I felt for people in the healthcare field, mental health professionals, to disabuse her of her illusions of satanic ritual abuse. But what I found is that she consulted a woman who's tied in with the network that, gave, uh, that has given lectures at the conference I was at before, a, a, uh, a clinical psychologist. So the oversight on this is, is horrific and, and definitely uh, something, something that needs to be confronted. We, we put together a petition against the, uh, against the therapist in question and we're protesting her pro professional organization next month. And um, I, I really hope we can bring some kind of remedy to that. But I also think we, uh, we need to think differently about, about this kind of idea of, of, of there being a, a, a safe insular structure in which nobody is questioned on their bizarre beliefs because it can, uh, can spiral out of control and we see what can ultimately come of it. Particularly disturbing to me is that we find uh, recent Pew polls show that 40% of millennials and 35% of Democrats are for censorship if it's uh, deemed offensive to minority groups. That, that seems like a, a very, that, that seems like a very dangerous path to go down, for, especially for me, being with the Satanic Temple, because we're often mischaracterized and sometimes the offense taken is completely wrong. And it hasn't always been right in the past. Um, you might be familiar with Edward O. Wilson uh, at Harvard University, also when he started the, his studies in sociobiology. He was talking about biological basis of, uh, of social behavior, which I think we take pretty much for granted now. But at the time, people thought that uh, this kind of refutation of the blank slate was, uh, was opening the door to racist notions of eugenics and that type of thing. In, in no less than Noam Chomsky had to come forward and, and say what should have been obvious to everybody, that humans are biologically based and should be studied as such. And, and eventually, I, I don't think people think even of Edward Wilson uh, at all now uh, related to this controversy. No, nobody thinks of him as, as a racist or anything else. But at the time, people were throwing things at him when he was giving public lectures and that kind of thing. And now, and also the uh, study of child sexual abuse is still such a taboo topic that if anything challenges the dominant narrative, it's so easy to dismiss somebody as, as defending pedophilia or ruin their reputations in a similar way that people are afraid to do it. And another case of that that would be worth looking up is the, uh, is the Rind paper controversy. Um, some scientists led by a guy with the last name of Rind put together a meta-analysis of, uh, of surveys done on people who suffered from some time, kind of child sexual abuse and uh, overall, his findings, the only real controversial element that was involved in that was that he found that uh, people who had been molested weren't necessarily uh, resigned to a life of, of crippling mental damage, that type of thing. Um, he certainly wasn't saying pedophilia was right. None of the scientists were. They were just looking at the data of, of what they could find from the people who had suffered it. And, and it's, it's, you have to look at the facts if you want to help people who actually survived. But this was altogether too much, and it was the first scientific paper that was censured by an act of Congress after Laura Schlesinger uh, took it up and, and made a, a big cause out of it. And eventually, uh, Tom DeLay made it his own personal cause as well. And, and I think the paper ended up retracted. I'm not, I'm not sure. But, but not on scientific grounds in the least. Now, the, uh, the need to be able to engage in offensive speech, I, I would argue for, because obviously we do that. Um, you may be aware that, uh, that we did what we call the pink mass at the grave of the mother of Fred Phelps, Jr., 
while he was still alive um, in protest of the Westboro Baptist Church. This was in response to the Boston Marathon bombings when the Westboro Baptist Church said that they were going to come and protest the funerals of the people who had died during the bombing. Um, they didn't show up. Uh, a lot of people in Boston were, were waiting for them there and things could have gotten easily quite ugly. Um, but at the time, there was a petition going around Boston to actually get the government to intervene and prevent the Westboro Baptist Church from showing up, which I, I didn't think was appropriate. What I thought was appropriate was that we found a way to protest them on our own. So we went and conducted a homoerotic ceremony at the mother of Fred Phelps Jr. And we, I, I respectfully rested my testicles on her grave and declared her a lesbian in the afterlife. But we were also clear that we didn't hold any supernatural beliefs, but that we felt that due to their supernatural beliefs, they were obligated to believe that she was a lesbian in the afterlife. And that no matter what they said, our belief was inviolable. And we were going to believe that they believed that she was a lesbian in the afterlife, despite anything they might say. <laughs> they had made the inviolability of belief argument uh, all the way to the Supreme Court to uphold their right to protest. When Fred Phelps Jr. was dying, my good friends at Vice asked me to uh, write a eulogy. And in part, I said, it is often considered proper form for the remaining party of two established enemies, when one is dead or dying, to make disingenuous statements of remorse, to express that nobody wishes death upon their opponent. You'll find no such dissembling from me. As I write this, Fred Phelps is now in the process of doing probably the one thing that he'll ever do, for which you will have my gratitude. He is dying. And while some part of me thinks the sooner the better, another part of me hopes he lingers long enough to savor the full terror that must consume a mind as superstitious and bitterly haunted as his during the last moments of life. In his life, Phelps can be credited with many an inadvertent positive influence. As a caricature of cruel religious-based inhumanity, Phelps often rallied people in opposition to his stupidity, and he served as a ludicrous arch-villain, he was a living argument ad absurdum in support of all things he de detested and, and decried. On the eve of Phelps' death, I think there is much that the American public can be proud of. We can be proud not only of the strong counter-protests that followed the Westboro Baptist Church wherever they flagrantly and tastelessly displayed their disgusting malice, but also that we live in an environment where Fred Phelps was allowed to publicly spew his vindictive ideas with such infuriating and thoughtless impunity. It is infinitely better to suffer the few Fred Phelpses we surely, that will surely always exist than to live in a political environment in which odious speech is regulated by an officiating body. So I think that kind of embodies my thinking and values on free speech. And if anybody can read that and say that I'm defending Fred Phelps' ideas, I'm comfortable just saying that they're stupid. <laughs> I feel that way about the, the KKK also. There was recently a KKK rally where they were violently assaulted. And I think when you censor or even violently assault somebody like the KKK, you give them too much credibility. You, you really empower them. You make them feel victimized. Uh, you give them a martyrdom complex. If you mock them, if you ridicule them, if you diminish them and show them, expose them for the idiots that they are, that is, that is infinitely superior. And then you, you, you actually hope to achieve something. Instead of assaulting the KKK, I wouldn't say leave them alone, but if I were in that vicinity, I think the idea would have been to hire clowns with banjos, pile them all into a little car, and trail along playing a, a mocking little soundtrack around them the whole time. I mean, make a, make a laughable spectacle out of it and make them go home feeling like idiots. That's my take. <laughs> now, another situation where I feel like we get into dangerous territory where we arbitrarily throw out terms like, uh, like uh, hate speech or marginalizing to minorities is um, when we were going to do a black mass event at Harvard, we were asked by a student group who was exploring different uh, religious traditions if we could do some kind of presentation for their student group and if there was some kind of ritual we could attach to it. And I explained that we weren't really given to ritual or, or rote kind of procedure because we're about individual will and that type of thing, but the idea of the black mass was something that was well worth exploring as a springboard into the philosophy of Satanism, as well as the history. The idea being that 
the idea of a black mass came from Catholic propaganda against the other and was used to marginalize and justify killing people, but then was later embraced in some form by people who used it as a declaration of personal independence. And I was trying to explain to the press at the time that our practice of a black mass at this point was as far removed from uh, Catholicism as, as Easter is removed from its pagan roots. But, but it didn't take. And um, you, you see, there was some over 1,500 Catholics marching through Cambridge uh, to protest our, our little black mass reenactment event, some of them sobbing. And I couldn't help but note that these were the exact same people who just some few years before couldn't be moved to take to the streets when they found out that their institution, especially there in Boston, was a, a pedophile ring. Now, in Phoenix, we put out a press release in January. Actually, our people in Phoenix applied to give an invocation at the city council um, in December. And the, the city clerk just signed off on it and said, that's fine. And um, it wasn't until January we put out a press release. And I explained in the press release that uh, church-state separation advocates Andrew Seidel and Diane Post from the Freedom From Religion Foundation have been urging Phoenix for a number of years now to discontinue their policy of allowing their city council meetings to be open with a public prayer. Seeing those requests ignored, FFRF has fought hard to ensure that plurality is respected, that any religion enjoys a voice in city hall, and that atheist invocations will be heard too. With this open forum now in place, marginalized voices from alternative, alternative religious views may now enjoy a degree of exposure that is unprecedented. And I, 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 wanted, uh, I wanted to point out the, the difficult situation that Phoenix was in with us giving the invocation. That would be the demand for attendance. And I said, there's certainly no novelty at all to Christian invocations, and nobody is at a loss to find Christian houses of worship if they so choose. Satanism, on the other hand, is still largely a mystery to the general public. When public forums allow for religious displays or performances, they do so to our advantage. We're grateful for Phoenix's public platform for Satanists, and I believe the people of Phoenix can expect us to be regular contributors to their religious milieu, thanks in part to their city council. Mm -hmm. Something that was disturbing, though, about, uh, about the discussion that followed was people felt that the, the relevant question in all of this was, what do we believe? And, and, and what could they expect from us? And, and what intentions do we have? And while we do have our own tenets and our own beliefs, which tend to have nothing to do with what they think they do. Um, I'm, I also was explaining in some of the interviews that that was not the question at all. We could be everything they thought we were. We could be the, this hateful, cruel group, and they opened the door to us. It is just simply not the place of the government to act as arbiter of what is proper religious or political speech, and I hope it stays that way. Now, here's some here is some of the disturbing outcry that came at the next city council meeting. There is a constitution greater than the American constitution, and it is substantiated or sustained by God himself. I'm going to read the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Satanism is not a religion, it's a cult. Because yeah. I think their goal is to silence prayer as opposed to doing invocation. Their goal is to silence any kind of prayer whatsoever. We take a pledge of allegiance, it's one nation under God. That's not out there by mistake. How many people actually have a dollar bill or a piece of money in their wallet or their pocket. I do believe it says, in God we trust. Yeah. Yeah. I've got people that are ready to demonstrate if you don't stand up for God. And right now, our domestic enemies seem to be pretty great. They are a hate group, and specifically, they are a misogynist group. You will see images of Michelle Short in bondage, in nudity, um, in all kinds of uh, positions that are not appropriate. A hate group who promotes violence against women. 
their main goal is to silence any expression, any religious expression in public life. And I do agree with you that it is a cult. It's not a real religion. There are very few times that I actually get to hear a man of my faith or a woman of my faith get up and give the invocation. I stand quietly and I allow it to happen. I don't dispute other religions, other faiths from their opportunity to do this. I believe the government, the city council, the city of Phoenix has that necessity to allow people who apply to give this invocation to give the invocation. We can't allow the members of the city council and mayor to pick and choose who they want to give the invocation and only invite those people. Two fucking minutes, that's all we needed to speak. And they were saying that we were trying to silence everybody, that we were, uh, that, that they were putting all these values onto us that had nothing to do with who we are. Uh, they were also saying, as you heard, that we're a hate group and specifically a misogynistic hate group. And you may wonder where that came from. That comes from the fact that the, the woman I showed in the picture earlier is a model and there, there are, you can find pictures of her where she's in, in less than clothing. And this, of course, uh, induces people to, to beat and hate women. Um, but as I said, the idea of, of who we are and what we represent was the wrong question. And, and I think it should remain the wrong question. And we should insist upon the government viewpoint neutrality where they don't converge and decide whether they agree with the values in, in a specific community and whether they can speak on, on, on in, this, in the open forum or not. And I think that's what we, we risk when we ask for more prohibitions against free speech. It's misguided. Uh, a, an obvious case where, uh, where the progressive agenda went wrong and was co-opted by the, the religious right obviously is the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, this was actually passed federally under the Clinton administration in the 90s to uh, protect uh, minority religious groups. Uh, in particular, there's the peyote sacrament done by the Native Americans in, in some certain church, wherever. And, it was, uh, and they were being told that they could not do their peyote sacrament because this was a, a classified drug now and this was this was against uh, current drug laws. So uh, RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, was passed and, and upheld that there was, a, there was a certain burden of proof upon the government to show uh, that they could impede on somebody's religious practice as, as such. And, and now you know, uh, RIFRA is, is generally known for the, the state manifestations of that, passed state by state since uh, the gay rights revolution, where now there's this idea that there's there are bakers all over the place who are having their spirits corrupted because they have to make these gay cakes and, and they, they, won't be, they won't be allowed into heaven anymore at all. Um, people were contacting us as, as RIFRA became a, a topic of contention asking if there was a way that satanic businesses could deny the service of Christians. And of course, uh, I, I would like to think that a satanic business would, would, be, uh, would be open to inclusion that would bring them profit? Um, why, why, do, why do business so poorly? Um, one thing we thought we, we, we might like to do is we, we were pushing in Michigan where they were trying to pass RIFRA for an amendment to the bill that would ask that their discrimination be fully disclosed. So uh, far from putting prohibitions on speech, we wanted to make certain uh, hate speech mandatory to the, to the effect that if you're going to deny service to homosexuals or anybody else, you need to be upfront about that somewhere on the, the facade of the building, at the, at the doorway or whatever else, so the onus isn't on the people coming into your place of business to find out that they're not served and go through that inconvenience and, and potential humiliation. However, uh, our most creative use of RIFRA was our reproductive rights campaign. And um, it, we had actually drawn up a... a uh, a, a, an exemption form before Hobby Lobby. Um, and the exemption was against informed consent laws. And what the informed consent laws are, uh, they're, a, they're one of the weasel bills that are passed to make abortions more prohibitive, more difficult uh, to get. And uh, informed consent in particular uh, insists that women be given certain materials that are scientifically invalid and, and really meant to make them reconsider having an abortion at all, reconsider their, their, 
their point of view, um, going through narrated ultrasounds some of the time, being told that life begins at conception, and, um, and being counseled on all kinds of different alternative options and that type of thing. Uh, as problematic as that might sound and insulting as that might sound up front, um, in places like Missouri, uh, you find attached to the informed consent now a 72-hour waiting period in which a woman will come into the clinic, she'll have to receive these materials, and then can't have the procedure done until 72 hours later. Three days, and um, my understanding is there's only one clinic in Missouri that performs abortions at this point. So somebody might have to travel five, six hours, come get these materials, go all the way back, or spend the money for overnight lodging and that type of thing. And, and some people simply cannot do that. And our feeling with the informed consent materials is that it doesn't apply to us due to our religion and we're protected under RIFRA um, because we believe that the body is inviolable subject to one's own will alone and that includes fetal tissue um, and that we make our decisions based on the best scientific evidence and we feel that the best scientific evidence does not support the conclusion that life begins at conception. So uh, a year ago now about we actually got a plaintiff on this. She wanted to terminate her pregnancy in Missouri. Um, went in with an exemption form we, drew, we had drawn up saying that as a member of the Satanic Temple, the informed consent materials did not apply to her and therefore they could just go ahead and bypass that. They did not agree due to the state law. So we filed the lawsuit uh, immediately thereafter, a state lawsuit. And um, that leveraged RIFRA Later on, we filed a, a federal complaint, uh, which is really a straightforward First Amendment complaint. Um, here's the Missouri Informed Consent uh, booklet. Um, you can look it up online. The, f the full thing is there, and you, you can see how problematic it is. But um, fortunately, they, they highlight some of the most problematic elements for you. In, in, the, introduction, in the introduction, you see uh, a certain point of contention right up at the very top in bold. The life of each human being begins at conception. Abortion will terminate the life of a separate, unique, living human being. We would contend that that is, is obviously and flagrantly an item of religious opinion. And as such, uh, the, the government has no place in, in making its, its uh, dissemination mandatory. And to do so to somebody who shares our beliefs or doesn't share those beliefs in any case is a, is a violation of their First Amendment rights. And in our case, uh, definitely, definitely a RIFRA claim. Those, those claims are still pending in court right now. They're, they're really dragging their feet. I feel it my duty to point out that we did not secure pro bono support. ACLU never replied. So if you have the inclination, I think uh, this is the best thing going for reproductive rights right now. And it's the only thing to really turn the tide of religious abuse against uh, uh, people who believe differently than the conservative right. Um, we do have a... We, we do have a donation button for our, our legal click case online, so be sure to check that out. And if you buy our uh, merchandise, that goes towards all our campaigns as well. Um, another case where we were putting forward our, our free speech to much resistance was the case of the Baphomet Monument. And I'm sure you're probably aware of that. That, that, was, that, that uh, garnered quite a bit of press. Um, in Oklahoma in 2009, there was a bill passed that allowed for the Ten Commandments monument to reside on the state property outside the, outside the state house on Capitol grounds. Um, it, it's interesting, if you read these bills that are meant to justify the Ten Commandments, the bills are also written to rewrite history. And it's funny that once the, these bills are written and passed, they're then cited as academic text. Um, as, as some basis for history. So when these claims are made that the Ten Commandments has some kind of unique privileged place in American history as helping the codification of constitutional law, um, that, that is very much worth uh, contesting both on academic and, and uh, simple legalistic grounds because uh, what's coming next is, is an abridgment of any alternative religion's rights uh, to display a similar monument. Just as you could see in uh, the disturbing display in Phoenix where people are holding up money and saying, because it says in God we trust that they're given 
some kind of license that they that they have uh, that they're more privileged than any other religion. They're more equal, uh, so to speak, in Orwell's terms. Um, it, it gives you a sense of how any time that uh, that line between church and state is crossed over, you need to beat it back and beat it back very hard and immediately because that's only a first step. I know some people think, you know, that it, it doesn't mean that much that we say um, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance or that the money says in God we trust. But you can see that that's just, that's just one element and it just keeps growing from there. And now those bits of evidence are used for the idea that this is a Christian nation and that, the, the, that Christians have exclusive privilege and exclusive rights. And that's something uh, I felt uh, was very uh, aptly displayed in our monument battle. I, I felt the, the symbolism is, is so bombastic and, and catching and, and everything our victory would mean in the Baphomet uh, battle uh, would, uh, would, it would show so much, you know, just to have our monument there next to the Ten Commandments. It would make people think different, I think. It would think correctly about the place of, of plurality and about religious liberty in the United States. Obviously, it's, it's a lesson many people need, and, and many people uh, even, even in our public offices, which is very disturbing. Um, in Oklahoma, uh, we were surprised. We wanted to file our lawsuit against Oklahoma for not replying to our request around the time we were going to have our unveiling of the completed monument in Detroit. But uh, to our surprise, the state Supreme Court uh, ruled that the Ten Commandments monument needed to come down. There was an ACLU suit against it, uh, Establishment Clause case, but uh, based on the state constitution. The state constitution is very explicit in its separation of church and state, saying no federal funds or federal property can be used for religious purposes. And the, there was a prevalent feeling in the media, and we, they reached out to us quite a bit, which was surprising. Usually, if, if, we're, not, if we're not mentioned exclusively, people don't, don't realize our role in anything at all. Uh, around the Black Mass event, the Pope himself said that um, pedophilia somehow wasn't the problem of the Catholic Church because uh, that was not a Catholic activity. It would be similar to doing, it would be, it was similar to doing a Black Mass. And sometime around uh, uh, the height of our monument press also, Putin said, made some kind of comment about how uh, Americans are trying to put uh, Satanism on a level equal to traditional religion. And uh, I really thought the, the press would be off the hook for that, but nobody seemed to put it together. It was us. But they did credit us for the, uh, the Ten Commandments coming down, saying that the Supreme Court of Oklahoma must have had in mind that if they ruled in some way to keep up the Ten Commandments, they were going to have a very difficult time and they were going to have to be reckoning with, with our case uh, soon enough. Um, but our unveiling event met with all kinds of controversy and protest as well. It was similar to what you could see in Phoenix. Uh, all of a sudden, the mainstream religious groups felt that they were persecuted and that we were a hate group and that somehow by our activities, even having a, a private event, it was a ticketed event, but nobody had to attend it, um, that somehow we were trying to, uh, that we were trying to silence them, that we were trying to silence the, the Christian voice. And of course, you see this idea of, of Christian privilege. Uh, anytime it's dampened, they, they feel persecuted, and, and certainly in the gay rights movement and everything else. Now, here was an image from when the Ten Commandments was coming down. Um, I was going to show earlier, the, after the Pink Mass, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church put together one of their uh, famous flyers against us. And, uh, and, and in one image on the flyer, which they post on many things, there was an American flag. And in front of them were, were two uh, stick characters, the type you see on, on restroom doors to indicate the, the generic person. And one was bent over and the other was behind him for whatever reason. But it looks suspiciously similar to <laughs> the shadows there. Some of this, is, it's all very prophetic. And when Pat Robertson was complaining about us, uh, he, was, he was crying the apocalypse and he was saying, what next? Is there going to be a ritual on some state house lawn? And everybody laughed and said, he's a delusional old man. Months later, the Detroit chapter of the Satanic Temple did a ritual on the state house lawn in, in East Lansing 
because they had allowed some kind of Christian performance there as well and had opened the door. So Pat Robertson is still a delusional old fart. Ah. Here was some of the, the outrage surrounding Baphomet. Okay, so now you're, you're happy because you got the Ten Commandments taken down, but do you, are you still pushing to have the goat with the horns and so on put up on the state capitol grounds? No, we, we don't want our monument there without the Ten Commandments there. Um, the point uh, all along was that it would complement and contrast the Ten Commandments and reaffirm that we live in a pluralistic nation that respects uh, diversity and religious liberty. First of all, we say that being a homosexual is a constitutional right. Before that, we said that slaughtering unborn babies was a constitutional right. And now we want to unveil a statue of Satan in the midst of that economically plagued city. Can you believe that? Where are we headed? It's evil. Not a good role model. So they, yeah. should they, be, they should be able to put the statue up, and then they should be shot right next to it, and then we take it down. Evil will not destroy us. It will pervert us. Isn't this what is going to bring the judgment of God upon us? But the thing with the, you know, the, the horns and so on, the, the Ten Commandments goes up because not only does it have some religious meaning, but it has historical meaning too. I mean, would you acknowledge that about the Ten Commandments? Well, I would, uh, well, yes, if you would acknowledge that. Baphomet has historical uh, meaning as the well. Baphomet is the goat back, with the, uh, yeah. The image at least goes back to the 19th century. It's at least as old as Mormonism in the case. In the end, we will beg the, the Lord above to destroy us. We will beg for destruction. You say, could we possibly be serving idols? Can we be sacrificing our babies uh, to some uh, heathen god? Uh, is there something that we're going to be having ritual sacrifice on the state house lawn of some state? Are we making a mockery of everything with regard to Christianity in this society? Now we're going to have a satanic monument next to the Ten Commandments, really? I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled that it, the Ten Commandments, that the displays not only have a religious significance, but also a historical one. Well, you're talking a different type of issue because in Oklahoma, they were ruling by the state constitution, not the federal constitution. I know, so it's but entirely it's a different issue. If you're talking it's Texas, different. it's a moot point. It's not that different, but you're right. Oh, Texas. It's different. In, in we're te talking different constitutions. I, I've looked at them both. State constitution versus federal constitution. I, I know. So I looked at them both. And then I, I practiced law for like a decade too, so I, I, I did read them and see. A lot of similar words. Lucian, thank you. Good luck to you. And, and, and I taught you, and I taught you that there was a separation between the uh, that there was a difference between the federal constitution and the state constitution. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Good to see you. Let the media of the world mock me. Are we going to be allowing this to happen? And while we're doing it, we'll be having polygamy and polyamory and all the other things that go along with a co corrupt culture. Is that the way we're heading? Well, it looks like it is. There is a statue to Lucifer that has been, that has been erected. This country was not based on Satan. Now, you may be mistaken on that. I mean, you may have your own plan. That doesn't matter what this country was based on. It, it does. That's not, listen, they can have it. I'm sorry to double think. Time magazine says it's really not that big of a deal. Let me tell you, it is a big deal. God will not be mocked on his own land by his own people who are covenant people. And at the same time, on Monday, they remove his words in Oklahoma in the middle of the night. So now uh, Oklahoma is fighting to bring the Ten Commandments back. They actually want to revise their state constitution so that um, they take out the, uh, the items that separate church and state. Uh, it doesn't really get stupider than that. But in, uh, in Arkansas, they've passed a bill that plagiarized directly off the Oklahoma bill. And, um, and now they're looking to put up a Ten Commandments there, too. So. Uh, we're currently fighting the battle in Arkansas, and who knows, we might have to come back to Oklahoma.
But I, I didn't expect to get cut off by Megyn Kelly so early on. And what I was really trying to get her to do was say that a federal ruling uh, trumped any state ruling and that the, 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 federal, the federal finding in, in this Texas case needed to be abided by, by Oklahoma just because I thought it would be really nice to see uh, a Fox News commentator yielding to uh, the idea of, of federalism to that degree. But it, but it didn't happen. Otherwise, I would have argued that there was nothing in the, in the Texas ruling that would have kept Baphomet off of the property, which is true. Um, so in another way, we worry that they might try to ab abridge our speech is by citing community standards, some kind of vagary uh, related to what's offensive or whatever else, even though we're, we're very well protected um, as a, a religion, we, we also see, uh, like in the case in, in Florida, uh, there's Orange County Public Schools in Florida, and now uh, a public school group in, in Colorado where we're doing a similar thing that's in process right now. They're allowing the passive distribution of Christian literature, Bibles and, and pamphlets about Jesus and, and all that shit. And uh, passive distribution means they can set up a table, and, and if and if kids are so moved to do so, they can, they can get a copy and that kind of thing, which is fine, I guess, so long as they, they realize they open up an open forum, and that's what we were testing in Orange County when we applied to also give out our material, and, and all, all, all hell broke loose then, of course. It was originally the Freedom From Religion Foundation that reached out to us and apprised us of the issue, and um, they were asking, if perhaps we had materials we could give out uh, to, to students during this passive distribution open forum because they wanted to test what one of the attorneys at the Freedom From Religion Foundation now calls Lucian's Law, which is <laughs> when, you offer these, when you offer the satanic material to an open forum, they're either going to deny us and open themselves up to litigation or, uh, or they're going to shut the forum down. <laughs> no. Lucian's Law doesn't account for them actually allowing for us to distribute the material, but I didn't actually write it. When the Freedom From Religion Foundation reached out to us, they were clear, they said we could be very critical of religion, um, and, and they were, you know, the, the kind of material they wanted to put out was, was this. It, it's, it's material that's critical of, uh, critical of the Jesus story, critical of the Bible, and the school tried denying them on obscenity grounds previously, and then they, they threatened to sue, and then they were allowed. Um, because it turns out that all the material they were discussing was in the Bible, which was being distributed. But um, when they told us that we could be kind of confrontational and offensive like that, uh, we let them know that that's not really how we play things. We have our own affirmative values. We're not actually out just attacking the other side. We're, we're putting out our, our own material in our own right. And so... For that matter, the, uh, the school board was saying that they still reserved the right. As soon as this got out to the press that we had offered to, to submit material to them for passive distribution, the school board was trying to calm everybody down because there was already a, a big Catholic petition saying, keep, uh, keep Satanists out of schools and all this. And there was already uh, misreporting going on saying that we were already there and we were converting the young and that type of thing. And one, uh, one blog site even said that, that we must save the children from the horrors of, of the satanic activity book that we were putting out, which turned out was ridiculously benign, and intentionally so. We really didn't want to give them anything at all where they could point to community standards or, or, or any kind of pre-existing standards because they couldn't manufacture new ones and say that this is in some way offensive. This was absolutely beyond reproach. There was nothing... Uh, negative they could find about it, very pro-social, and just some activities in there, word searches, uh, maze, connect the dots, that type of thing, and no real philosophy in it because we're not really for proselytization at all. We were making a point about the separation of church and state, and it worked. They, they shut down the open forum rather than, than subject children to the horrors of this activity book. Here were some of the activities. Um, the word search and, and the, the connect the dots, uh, the, the image might not be clear to you now, but actually in this, in this video clip, uh, you see actually how it connects. Hispanic children's coloring book is creating controversy in Orlando, but if you read between the lines, the issue is a lot deeper than black and white. The Orange County School Board is considering changing its 
police regarding religious materials after a group of local Satanists asked to hand out a Satanic-themed coloring book. The request is in response to the board allowing other religion, religious groups, that is, to leave Bibles and booklets for students. Public education in America often uses coloring books to teach young Americans about math, science, and current events. This year, a new book filled with games and lessons about Satanism could be distributed to students attending public school in Florida's Orange County. The 10-page Satanic Children's Big Book of Activities features characters named Annabelle and Damien who demonstrate rituals to explain Satanism. This expanding wealth of information for America's young minds was made possible after a Florida judge last month ruled that if the Orange County School District allowed Christian groups to disseminate Bibles and other materials in its schools, then other religious and atheist groups should be given the same right to distribute their material and followers of the Antichrist seized on the decision to treat all faiths equally. A spokesman for the Satanic Temple tells Raw Story that, quote, if a public school board is going to allow religious pamphlets and full Bibles to be distributed to students, as is the case in Orange County, Florida, we think the responsible thing to do is to ensure that these students are given access to a variety of different religious opinions, as opposed to standing idly by while one religious voice dominates the discourse and delivers propaganda to youth, unquote. Bible distributions are, are a good thing. Uh, they haven't caused any problems. Uh, they've, they've gone on without incident. Uh, but now by creating controversy, uh, this group is, is maybe perhaps getting what it wants. In my office alone, I received close to 11,000 emails in one 48-hour period on this issue. And it gives you an idea of the level of disruption that it was causing. A spokesperson for the Satanic Temple says it's laughable that religious groups think that the inability to distribute their materials exclusively is discriminatory against them. I think if you're going to put our material juxtaposed to the standard material, you're going to find that Satan is wildly popular with the kids. In a ruling that was aimed at maintaining religious neutrality, students who may never have intended to learn about Christianity, atheism, or Satanism will now receive an introduction to all three. Okay, that's all I got. I hope I made some kind of point. <laughs> Let me know.